Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to present uh, at the, the first uh, Milner Therapeutics Institute webinar. And thank you for everyone who's joining the webinar today. So I'd like to tell you in the next 25 minutes or so about our work using fun functional genomics approaches to guide cancer drug discovery. And everyone will be aware that genomics-driven precision medicine approaches are increasingly being used in the clinic to develop more effective medicines as well as less toxic ones. But unfortunately today, the reality is that most patients don't benefit from this type of precision medicine approach. And so there's still a real pressing need for new and, and more effective therapeutics. And so my lab is interested in understanding how the molecular alterations that occur in the genomes of cancer cells contribute to disease mechanisms as well as therapy response. And so to achieve this, we've developed what I would describe as a preclinical discovery ecosystem, combining multiple different aspects. So this includes cell model generation, so making new models of cancer, as well as deep genetic analysis of the models that we have and we're generating. We've also established very large scale functional perturbation platforms, and in particular, drug sensitivity testing, as well as CRISPR-based screening. And to help us understand and interpret these data sets, we develop new analytical tools, as well as web-based platforms to make them available to the community. And of course, we are very interested in understanding the mechanisms that under, underpin uh, the activity of different therapeutics. And all, all of this really is, is working towards developing new therapeutic strategies in the preclinical setting. And in recent years, we've kind of put a lot of this work under the banner of what we call the cancer dependency map. So this is a collaboration with the Broad Institute in the US, as well as the European Bioinformatics Institute here in the UK. And the aim of the dependency map is to use large scale functional perturbation in cancer models to identify as many dependencies as we can in every single cancer cell, if possible, to really drive or, or um, uh, catalyze the future of precision cancer medicine in the future. So to do this, we've been basically building up a map uh, of cancer dependencies and aggregating large scale functional genomics data sets. And that's depicted here, um, where between the Sanger and the Broad Institutes, we now have collections of over 1600 cancer models. These are primarily 2D cancer cell lines, most of which have been very deeply characterized, both genetically and functionally. And what's shown on the right hand of your monitor is just the level of annotation of each of those 1700 models. And so this includes things like whole exome sequencing, as well as I mentioned before, uh, drug testing, as well as uh, CRISPR screening. Now, most of the work in my group over many years has focused on a subset of these lines, approximately a thousand of them, that we very deeply characterize in my own laboratory. But of course, going forward, what we really want to do is integrate all of these data sets together. I just wanted to highlight for those that might not be aware that my lab hosts a number of data portals where you can access these data sets, you can uh, analyze them, and you can visualize those results. So I encourage you to have a look if you haven't seen these before. So in my presentation today, what I want to do is give you three examples of how we're using the DEPMAP data sets to really facilitate cancer drug discovery. The first is really about how we're using these data sets to find new oncology targets. The second is how we're using the data sets to really look at the function of gene fusions in cancer. And lastly, an unpublished study where we're using these data sets to really probe drug mechanism of action in cells. So I think most people will be familiar with the very poor success rates of drug development in oncology. And unfortunately, in fact, it's not that the success rates are low, but it's actually the number of drugs to new targets is actually in decline. But of course, there are many unexplored targets out there that we don't know whether they would actually make good drug targets in the future. And so what we aim to do is use CRISPR screens to nominate new targets 
but also a wider range of new targets um, through this CRISPR screening-based approach. So we've performed uh, over uh, 900 genome-wide CRISPR knockout screens in 324 cancer cell lines, representing very common cancers like colorectal and breast cancer, as well as cancer types of unmet clinical need, such as ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer. And this just gives you a sense of the number of fitness genes that we identify in each cancer cell line. And when I say fitness gene, that means a gene that is required for cell growth or survival. And we typically find about 1,400, 50, uh, 1400 fitness genes per cancer cell line in our collection. And overall, we found about 7,500 unique fitness genes. So it's a very large number, about 40% of the genes that we tested are required for the fitness in at least one cer of one cancer cell line. So the challenge becomes if you're trying to identify new oncology targets, how do you prioritize this set of 1,000, 7,000 genes? So to do this, we developed a very systematic target prioritization framework that I'll just quickly walk you through now. So on the left-hand side, you'll see what we did is we took our CRISPR screening data. We first identified those genes that are required for the fitness of only a subset of cancer cell lines. We then integrated these fitness scores with additional data sets, including patient genomic data. So was the gene, for example, altered in patient tumors? Does it have differential expression in cancer? We also linked differential fitness scores in our cell lines to genomic biomarkers that might help us predict why some cell lines are dependent on specific genes. And finally, we looked to see if there was additional evidence at the level of pathways that supported the role of a specific gene in the fitness of cancer cells. We did this type of analysis for each cancer type in our set, as well as across all cancer types together and what we call a pan-cancer analysis. And what you actually get from this is a priority score for each gene, what we call a target priority score. And then we also divided these different targets based on their tractability for drug development. Using this framework, we identified over 600 candidate priority targets. And those are depicted here, where a higher priority score means a, a greater confidence that this would make a good drug target and they're stratified by their tractability for drug development. A particularly notable candidate target we identified is indicated with an asterisk in the middle of your screen is WRN or Werner helicase. We were able to identify that Werner helicase is a very selective dependency in the setting of microsatellite unstable cancer cells. So these are cells that have a deficiency in mismatched DNA repair. And we could see this selective dependency in microsatellite unstable cells or MSI cells when we looked pan cancer in gray, but as well as specifically in ovarian and colorectal cancer cells. And the magnitude of this fitness effect is very typical to what we would see with a completely essential protein such as a ribosomal protein. We've gone on to investigate this further, and although I don't have time to take you through the data, I'll summarize it just briefly. We've been able to show that loss of Werner selectively induces apoptosis in MSI cells, as well as chromosomal instability. And that in fact, it's the helicase activity of Werner that's required in these cells, suggesting that actually if you were to develop a drug to Werner, you might choose to selectively target the helicase activity. We've also performed subcutaneous xenograft models using inducible knockdown of Werner in an MSI cell. And what we were able to show is that we were able to lead to tumor regression or stabilization when we knocked out Werner helicase in these cells. And in addition, we see a reduction in proliferation and an induction of apoptosis in those tumors. So collectively, this really uh, nominates Werner helicase as a candidate new target in the setting of MSI cancers. And we know that this has led to a number of drug discovery efforts in industry.
I think more broadly, this study really just shows the, um, the power of using CRISPR screens to try and nominate new targets, and particularly, as I mentioned, our goal of finding a broader range of new oncology targets. Of course, all of these will need to be validated with further investigation. So just changing gears for a bit, I'd like to turn to my second story, which is about our work looking at the function of gene fusions in cancers. So we know that fusions are very important in cancer. They have a very important diagnostic role, prognostic role, and actually they're the target of some of our most effective cancer drugs. What's happened in the last few years though with next generation sequencing is there's been a huge explosion in the number of gene fusions that have been described. And for most of them, we don't know actually if they're just a passenger event or they have a functional role and whether they could be actually clinically informative. And so we sought to address this problem. So we performed RNA sequencing on all thousand cell lines in our collection and using three di different uh, colors, we combine these to identify over 8,300 fusion events in our cell lines. And what's shown in the plot here is just for each cell line split up by tissue type, how many fusions we identified. Now to determine whether a fusion was functional, we turn to our CRISPR data using three independent data sets, the data from the Sanger Project Score, as well as data from the Broad Institute and another published study. Now, when you perform a CRISPR screen, you typically have multiple guides per gene. And then when you try and evaluate the fitness effect of knocking down a gene, you take the average of those multiple guides. But here we've actually not done that. And we've looked at the, the individual guide effects and so what we looked at is whether or not a guide mapped to the portion of the gene that was contained within the fusion transcript, what we call mapping guides, and compared the fitness effect to the subset of guides that map to the gene, but outside of the fusion. So they're not present in the fusion transcript. And we can look at the difference in the fitness effect of what we call the mapping guides that are in the fusion transcript, and the non-mapping guides, which are outside of the fusion transcript. And we can do this for each of the two partner genes. And so for each fusion transcript, where we have mapping guides, we're able to calculate a fusion essentiality score. This is just an example here for a particular fusion of KMT2A and MLLT3 in an AML cell line. And what you can see is the gray bars reflect those guides that map to the fusion transcript and the white ones are those bars are those where the guide does not map. And what we can see is a selective fitness effect only in the subset of guides that are mapping to the fusion itself. And so this gives us evidence that in fact, knocking down this fusion uh, leads to a fitness deficit in this particular cell line. Now we've done this for thousands of these fusions and that's depicted here where we calculated uh, fusion essentiality scores for over 2,800 different fusions in our cell line set for which we had differentially mapping guides. And overall what we found is that actually we found um, positive evidence for a fusion being functional only in a very small subset of 129 or 5% of all fusions suggesting that at least looking at the fusions through this approach, that the majority are not functional. And of course, using this approach, we were able to recover many of the bona fide fusion genes that you might be familiar with. For example, the EWSR FLY1 fusion in Ewing sarcoma. I'll also note is that we actually identified many fusions that were in frame and contained an oncogene, but nonetheless did not have a functional effect in this assay. And I think one corollary of this is maybe consideration needs to be given when interpreting sequencing data about the functional role of any particular fusion. So we're able to use these data to also identify um, uh, actionable fusions. So these are known fusions, but in new histologies. So one example, uh, we found a BRD4 uh, NUT M1, which is characteristic of NUT midline carcinoma, but here we found it in a small cell lung cancer 
And we were able to go on to show that this actually conferred sensitivity to a BET inhibitor uh, has been shown previously. In addition, we found a ROS1 fusion in breast cancer and a RAF1 fusion in pancreatic cancer and showed that this conferred exquisite sensitivity to drugs targeting either the fusion or downstream signaling pathways, as you might expect. So these are rare events, but they're potentially actionable ones in new histologies. Interestingly, we also identified fusions in our spondin in esophageal carcinoma cell line and a cholangeal carcinoma cell line. Now this fusion, the exact same fusion, is frequently observed within colorectal cancers and confers sensitivity to drugs targeting the Wnt pathway, in particular porcupine inhibitors. Now interestingly, unlike in colorectal cancer, the cells that had these fusions, the esophageal carcinoma and the cholangeal carcinoma, were insensitive to the porcupine inhibitor, suggesting that in some context, the tissue lineage may also be and an important determinant of response to fusions and drugs targeting those fusions. We also identified a recurrent new fusion uh, involving YAP1 and MALM2. This was identified in three different cell lines from different cancer types. This had actually been observed at a very low frequency in nasopharyngeal carcinoma and skin cancer, but the functional role had not been described. And we were able to show in each of the three cell lines that those guides that target the fusion are selectively required for the fitness of cells. And in addition to that, we were able to show that what this fusion most likely does is it leads through YAP1 to activation of the TAD1 transcription factor that leads to increased signaling through the HIPPO pathway. And in fact, a number of companies have active drug discovery efforts targeting the HIPPO pathway. And our data would suggest that these patients, although very rare, may in fact respond to therapeutics targeting the HIPPO signaling pathway. And what we were able to do is bring all of this together um, to basically functionally test the activity or the role of about 3,354 fusions. We did this with the CRISPR data, as I've shown you, but we did a similar type of analysis with our drug sensitivity data. And overall, we found about 12% of fusional fusions, we could identify a positive um, evidence for having a functional role. Now, I should be careful, we can't exclude that other fusions don't have a role that we're simply not measuring here. But it certainly supports the hypothesis that the vast majority of these fusions are not functional. And it also shows the ability to use this type of CRISPR-based approach to find new actionable fusions, as well as identify recurrent fusions, for example, in the HIPPO signaling pathway. And in the last few minutes of my talk, what I'd like to do is just to give you a, a little bit of a insights into a new story we've been developing, which is how we can begin to integrate these CRISPR data with pharmacological screens of drug sensitivity to measure or, or, um, or inform on drug mechanism. So we know already that polypharmacology or lack of selectivity is a feature of most drugs uh, and certainly cancer drugs. And that's shown nicely on the right-hand side of your screen where there was a study where they system systematically looked at the activity of clinical kinase inhibitors and what kinases they inhibited and, and really Ultimately, what they found is that the majority of kinase inhibitors target multiple kinases, as, as you might expect. And of course, as I've told you before, drug development success rates are low, and that may be in part really to the challenges of defining a drug mode of action, and not just biochemically, but in fact, the activity of a drug within a cell, which may be quite different than measuring its biochemical activity. And so we hypothesized that we could use our depth map data to investigate the cellular drug mode of action. And so to do this, what we did is we took um, drug response data for 480 drugs, as well as our gene fitness effect data from our CRISPR screens in, in 484 cell lines and used linear regression models to look for associations between drug essentiality by CRISPR and drug sensitivity 
the treatments across the panel of 484 cell lines. And that's depicted on the right hand side is just one example where we've looked at the fitness effect of MCL1 knockdown um, on your X axis, as well as the sensitivity to an MCL1 inhibitor in the drug screen. And you can see that these are two are very highly correlated and very significantly correlated. And so what we did is we didn't just ask this for one drug and one gene, we actually compared all possible 8 million single gene drug associations and tested all of them. So all genes across all drugs. Drugs themselves represented 397 unique drugs. These included FDA approved drugs, drugs in clinical development, as well as investigational oncology compounds. And many of them, or in fact, the majority of them were small molecule inhibitors. And overall, what we were able to do is identify 865 significant associations between drug sensitivity and CRISPR gene dependency. So these are of 865 significant associations of the 8 million tested. And these are shown here where each circle represents one of those associations. So what we were, could immediately see is that most of these were positive associations, meaning that they were going kind of in the same direction. And we could also map this data onto protein-protein interaction networks. And what we could also see is that the strongest associations, the ones indicated in orange, are those where the CRISPR or the gene is the target of the drug itself. So that means effectively that if you knock out the target of the drug, you get a very similar response profile as you do with the inhibitor itself, which of course is what you would hope to see. And so what we could do is do this um, mapping in this protein-protein interaction network. And what we could find on the left-hand side is that for 26% of the drugs that we tested, we could actually recover the target of that drug as a significant association. And that's the orange bar in the left-hand graph. But in fact, what we could also see is that for many other drugs, 21%, although we didn't recapitulate the target of the drug itself with the CRISPR, we could, we could find an association with a gene that was closely linked within the protein-protein interaction network itself. So in total, uh, we think that for about half of drugs, we're either recovering the target or a component of the network in which it operates. Um, but we also observed that for 46% of the drugs we tested, we couldn't find any associations with CRISPR at all. Now this could be to technical reasons, or it could indicate that these drugs may lack potency in this assay or may suffer from a lack of specificity. And in support of this, we took an independent data set shown on your right hand side that measured drug binding efficiency using a kinal bead affinity assay. And what we could show is for those drugs where there was a significant association with the target, so those are the yes um, examples here, what we could find is that they tended to have a higher a binding affinity using this kinal bead assay to their target. And so both of these data, set, data really point to the fact that there seems to be a relationship between our ability to recover the target of a drug with a CRISPR and the potency and specificity of that drug. And this just shows some of the associations we see and also support this relationship between the ability to recover the target and the selectivity and potency of the drug. So 46 of the top 50 associated drugs, we recovered their nominal targets. And these are the, some of the most significant associations we find. And this is nicely illustrated for EGFR inhibitors. We've screened, drug screened 10 EGFR inhibitors. And for all 10 EGFR inhibitors, we were able to show that knockout of EGFR with CRISPR was highly significantly correlated with the drug activity across the cell lines. So that's the orange bar. But not only that, we could show for all of these drugs that many of the downstream pathway components were also significantly correlated with the drug, including genes such as GRAB2 and SHIC2.
Another interesting example in your bottom right hand corner are IGF-1 inhibitors. And here again, we could recover the target of the drug itself. We could also recover associations with um, downstream signaling pathways. And interestingly, we also identified an association with a protein called furin. Now, I hadn't heard of furin before, but, but furin is a proprotein convertase that is required for processing of the IGF-1 receptor and is associated with higher levels of IGF-1 R in cells. And in this setting is highly correlated with sensitivity to IGF-1 R when you knock it down. We can also gain insights into drug mechanism of action using this type of analysis. A, a nice example of that are isoform selective PI3 kinase inhibitors. And this is clinically important because we know that on target activity of some PI3 kinase inhibitors to different isoforms can lead to uh, dose limiting toxicity in patients. And so for example, on your left, you'll see the, the associations for alpalisib, which is a PI3 kinase alpha selective molecule. And we see a very strong correlation with knockdown of PI3 kinase alpha, but not other PI3 kinase, PI3 kinase isoforms. In contrast, AZD8186 is a beta selective PI3 kinase inhibitor. And here you see a correlation with the beta isoform. Now, interestingly, we also had multiple pan PI3 kinase inhibitors shown in the middle panel. And here we failed to recover any of the PI3 kinase um, isoforms. And this could suggest lack of selectivity of these molecules or that they mediate their cellular effects through engaging multiple different PI3 kinase isoforms that aren't captured when we correlate response with an individual family member. Another interesting application is looking for off-target effects of drugs. So a brutinib on your right-hand side is a BTK inhibitor that's clinically approved. And what we could find in our association data is a correlation or an association with multiple components of the EGFR signaling pathway, including EGFR itself, ERB2, and ERB3, suggesting that that knockdown of ERB2, EGFR, and ERB3 kind of phenocopies the activity of, of abrutinib across our cell lines. And indeed, following um, our, this observation, there was a, a very recent report that actually showed that abrutinib is actually quite a potent EGFR inhibitor. So this is another example how we can use this data to actually define off-target activity of drugs. We can also find new insights into the activity of drugs, and in particular, the activity here of MCL1 inhibitors. So in our associations, we could see that MCL1 inhibitors, of which seven are shown here, so these are seven different MCL1 inhibitors, we could find a very clear and very significant association with MCL1 itself. But a second gene called March 5 was also very significantly associated with the MCL1 inhibitors. Now, MARCH5 is an E3 ubiquitin ligase involved in a mitochondrial fission, and it also has been implicated in regulating uh, protein levels of MCL1, although through a poorly understood mechanism. What we found particularly interesting is that we identified in the breast carcinoma cell lines that those cell lines that were independently sensitive to March 5 knockdown and MCL1 knockdown were more sensitive or most sensitive to an MCL1 inhibitor and more sensitive than the cell lines that are, sen that are sensitive to knockdown of either gene alone. Okay, so they're independently if you knock down MCL1 or March 5, these cell lines require them, and they tend to be more sensitive to an MCL1 inhibitor. And we could see this across all the MCL1 inhibitors that we tested. And in fact, the activity or the sensitivity is quite similar to what you see in the setting of hematological cancer cell lines, which is where these drugs are actually being developed clinically. And that's indicated by the dashed orange line in the right-hand side plot. 
So collectively, this is giving us new insights into the way that MCL1 um, uh, is, is working or MCL1 inhibitors are potentially working. It's, it's uh, highlighting a functional interaction between MCL1 and March 5, and then also suggest a new potential approach to really stratify breast cancer patients in, or solid tumor patients who might respond to an MCL1 inhibitor, although the mechanism is yet undefined. We can also begin to correlate our other genomic data with the associations that we see to find what we call robust pharmacological markers. So to do this, we've taken the subset of significant associations between a drug and a CRISPR knockdown and correlated each of them independently with genomic data. So this included genomic alterations, so mutations, as well as alterations in gene expression. And the reason we did this approach is it allows you to independently, using two independent data sets, identify overlapping robust pharmacological markers of response uh, to either drug knockdown, sorry, drug treatment, or gene knockdown. I think that's probably easier shown in an example here, where we have uh, robust markers of, of some drug sensitivity to, to kind of well-known targets. So on the very far left here, you have um, the response to PI3 kinase alpha knockdown and sensitivity to tasalisib, which is a PI3 kinase inhibitor. And in orange are those cell lines that have a mutation in PI3 kinase. And of course, what you see is that PI3 kinase mutational status is associated with increased sensitivity to tasalisib and also independently associated with increased dependency on PI3 kinase when knocked down. So this is what we would call a robust pharmacological marker. But we can also use this type of approach to find new insights as, as well as identify the context in which specific drugs are working. And a very nice example of that is the activity of a BIR, BIRC2 or IAP1 inhibitor. So using our associations, we identified correlations between uh, the BIRC2 inhibitor and its target, shown in the left-hand side by the bar, the orange bar, but also multiple components of the TNF signaling pathway in which this gene resides. These include, for example, MAP3K7. And when we did our independent biomarker analysis, we we're able to actually show that increased levels of TNF um, expression measured by RNA sequencing were associated with enhanced sensitivity to the inhibitor, shown on your far right, as well as increased dependency on MAP3K7 knockdown. And so we think this is interesting, not only because it actually gives us more confidence that TNF is a good marker uh, of uh, the IAP inhibitor activity, but it also begins to delineate the whole pathway where this biomarker might be important and also identifies additional targets in the same pathway where they're associated with TNF signaling. So I'd just like to conclude my talk by briefly summarizing the kind of three main points that I wanted to cover today as really uh, the final talk really explored or final part of the presentation explored how we can integrate drug sensitivity data with CRISPR knockout screening to really inform on many aspects of drug mode of action, including potency and specificity. I gave you some examples how we can use CRISPR screening to nominate new oncology drug targets. I think this is nicely exemplified by Werner Helicase, uh, which we think is a very exciting new candidate drug target. And also how you can use functional genomics to probe cancer gene function and specifically in this case, in case the action of uh, fusion transcripts or the activity of fusion transcripts in cancer cells. So with that, I'd just like to conclude by thanking the many people that have been involved in this work. It's an enormous team effort by a, a very large group, as well as uh, recognize some extremely um, rewarding collaborations that I have with, uh, with many other individual groups. So I'd like to thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to present my work at this webinar.